Thanks for joining us. Like Pandora said, my name is Lillian Metis, and I'm a nurse midwifery and women's health nurse practitioner student at Georgetown University. Today I'm going to be talking to you all about work, my work with women in crisis and specifically refugee women in the U.S. and in Greece. Um, this will be in a storytelling format, and I plan to share stories about how I got involved in the work, and then um, how also you can prepare for humanitarian work, how students can get involved early in their careers, and share some of the stories of the women I've come to care so deeply for. So I was happy to see in some of the polls that there are a few students and educators joining us. We'll have time for discussion and questions and sharing of some of your experiences at the end of the presentation. If you do have a question, um, please feel free to put it in the chat box, and if I can, I'll address it at the time. Otherwise, I'll address them all at the end. Um, and also, while I want, I want to address that there are refugees from many nations and cultures, um, my experience is with Muslim refugees, and that will be um, the focus for today. So before I begin, um, I just had two quick poll questions. Um, I'm not sure if the polls are set up. But otherwise, we can put them uh, the answers in the chat box. So I was just hoping that if you're joining us today, you could tell us if you have ever worked internationally, um, and if so, where, and also if you have ever worked with refugee women or infants. I think it just gives us a good gauge of what's going on, um, what are the experiences that we have in the room, um, and then also gives us um, a place where we can start a discussion at the end um, if you all have stories or experiences that you can share about. I'm going to continue on, um, and I thank you all for answering those questions, and please feel free to continue to put your answer in the chat box if you haven't had a chance yet. So, peace on earth begins with birth. Um, I wanted to begin the presentation with this quote because I think it sums up why midwives must be part of the crisis work around the world. Uh, we're champions of women's health, and we can play a part in the empowerment of women to change communities. This is just a bit of background on me. Um, like I said, my name is Lily, and I'm a student at Georgetown University. I live in Fremont, California, and I'm a registered nurse and certified as a domestic violence and sexual assault counselor, and I'm also certified in trauma counseling. Um, and I'm the incoming student representative to the American College of Nurse Midwives Board of Directors. So I wanted to share a bit about how I got started in crisis work as I started my career pretty young um, and also just to talk about how educators can be part of this process as well. So this picture is from my first experience in crisis work when I went to Southeast Asia as a high school student. Um, I worked with an organization called Rafa House that seeks to love, rescue, and heal victims of child sex trafficking. While I was there, I was able to learn about trafficking, um, the work of Rafa House, as well as the immense emotional, social, and physical needs of women and girls who have been sexually exploited and abused. I was able to spend time with a women's health care provider who worked at the safe house, learning about her work and the needs of the girls and the women. One of the young girls I met who had been trafficked was only four years old at the time. Several other older girls came into the safe house pregnant and terrified um, about what was going to happen to them. My idea of health care expanded, and I began to see how quality women's health care empowers women and girls. I didn't know it at the time, but of course, we all know that midwives do more than just deliver babies. We care for women across the lifespan, and we're uniquely equipped to work with women and girls like this in crisis. I knew that I had to do something to engage in justice work through reproductive health services. So when I came home, I began speaking and fundraising on behalf of Rafa House for a few years. Um, I first learned about midwifery care as an undergraduate nursing student at the University of Iowa. My professor for maternity and women's health was a nurse midwife, and after I expressed my interest to her, she agreed to be a mentor for me throughout school. 
She had worked extensively in international aid work as a midwife and also started a clinic in our hometown for low-income women. She taught me through mentorship stories, um, and she would even take me to the local free clinic and help with women's appointments. Um, I just mentioned this briefly to highlight to any of you that may teach at nursing schools or in midwifery programs that even if you're not able to do the work itself, um, such as my mentor was retired from clinical practice at the time, um, mentorship of students is integral to increasing the number of midwives who are working in crisis or low income areas. So after undergraduate, I moved to California, um, and my city in Fremont, California has the largest population of immigrants from Afghanistan um, and refugees in the U.S., and it's estimated to be anywhere from 60 to 80,000 Afghan refugees. For the past three and a half years, I've been working with an Afghan social services agency called the Afghan Coalition, um, serving refugee women. The needs in the community are vast from language to financial empowerment, chronic health conditions, post-traumatic stress disorder, and domestic violence. Despite all of the challenges that Afghan women face, they're hopeful and resilient. I'm currently the facilitator of domestic violence services at the Afghan Coalition and help to create a support group um, specific to Muslim women who have survived domestic violence. Um, and that's called Strong Together, and I can give you the link to that if you're interested to learn more. I'll share a few stories of the women I have worked with in the past years um, in this presentation. And prior to beginning midwifery school, I also worked as a nurse at a small community hospital where um, many Afghan women delivered their babies um, because it was one of the only hospital in the area that took under, un or underinsured women. So I'll share a bit about the care that these refugee women received as well. And of course, all of the names and pictures have been changed to protect the women that I work with. So while working as a newborn nurse at the hospital I just referred to, I had an experience that helped to guide and solidify my calling to midwifery. As a newborn nurse, I attended all the deliveries and provided newborn care and resuscitation. I would sometimes be a support for the woman, but was not actively involved in her care. Fatima was a young refugee from Yemen that spoke little English. She had received all of her prenatal care at the women's practice associated with the hospital. Throughout the prenatal period, she was seen by only the female provider in the practice, who also happened to be a Muslim immigrant, which helped the transition to the U.S. medical system. However, it wasn't made clear, unfortunately, to Fatima or her family that this provider may not be able to deliver the baby. When she came to the hospital, delivery was imminent, and the only obstetrician available was a male who she hadn't met. She was frantic and afraid, preparing to deliver her first child in a foreign country without an Arabic translator and only a male provider, which is strictly prohibited in her culture. Having worked with Muslim refugees for several years, I understood some of her concerns and her fear, but most of the staff did not. There was yelling, frantically trying to convince her to let the doctor in before the delivery. And finally, her mom um, convinced her to let him come inside the room right before the baby was born. There were many insensitive comments. Um, I even remember one of the providers saying, if she doesn't want me to care for her, then she can do it herself. Her eyes were wide and afraid during the delivery. And I think possibly she may have walked away traumatized by the situation and may not want to seek health care the next time she's pregnant. Refugee women and women of other underserved populations in my area lack access to midwifery care. While the hospital and the obstetricians try to provide care to them as best as they can, these women would benefit from care with a midwife. Our hallmarks of culturally competent care, involvement of family in the health care system, and in advocating for the woman to be an active member of her health care team may have improved this situation and possibly helped Fatima have an empowering and a beautiful experience delivering her first child. So this painting was made by one of the participants in the domestic violence support group that I help facilitate. Um, Nazia was an Afghan woman and she um, was part of one of the groups. 
She's another woman who inspired me to pursue education as a nurse midwife. She was married to her husband for many years and was never able to conceive. Um, we all know how heartbreaking this can be from women of any background, um, but specifically women who are Muslim and Afghan, um, infertility is a huge shame in the community and um, can be the source of um, much violence in the family. So her husband grew more and more upset about the infertility and eventually became emotionally and physically abusive of Nazia. She went several times to the local free health clinic where many Afghan women received care to talk about fertility issues with her provider. Unfortunately, she was never provided a translator and the physician didn't realize that Nazia didn't understand what was being explained to her. She continued going back but was never able to conceive. Eventually, her husband divorced her and married a younger woman. Several years later, a social worker went with her to an appointment. She learned that all along, Nazia could have had a simple procedure and likely achieved conception. By then, it was too late for her. The lack of understanding of the Afghan culture and the struggles that Afghan refugees face inspired me to become a midwife. And finally, I want to share with you about Shukriya. Her story expands on the needs of immigrants and refugees in the U.S. and how I believe midwives are uniquely prepared to handle them. Shukriya was a young Afghan woman, even younger than myself. She had a daughter who was a toddler and had recently delivered another daughter. Her husband, who was also emotionally and physically abusive, took the family for a visit back to Afghanistan. He left early to return home to California and prepare for the new family to permanently settle in California. When Shukriya came back several weeks later, she learned that her husband had stolen everything, including her immigration paperwork, got rid of their appointment, and disappeared with another woman. She was left without knowing the language or the system to care for two young children. For many nights, they slept in a 24-hour laundromat because it was the only place that they could find shelter until a social worker at the agency where I work was able to get them into a Muslim domestic violence shelter. There were many emotional, financial, and physical needs for this family, but I noticed after taking her to several health appointments that when the free clinic she attended provided a Dari translator, understood her culture, and asked questions about her, um, not just her situation or her health, she walked away feeling more optimistic and capable. I think midwives are prepared to walk with women through the lifespan, especially at trying times like the one Shukriya was going through. They can be the hub and the wheel. We can connect women to the services she needs. We're also educators. Uh, in addition to everything else Shukriya was going through, she didn't have any knowledge of basic nutritional or health topics for her children or herself. Midwives can provide culturally relevant education to empower women to be their own advocate and to be part of the healthcare team. So after working in the Afghan community for several years and meeting many, many women like the ones I just shared with you about, um, I decided that I would go back to school to become a midwife at Georgetown. I was having wonderful clinical experiences um, and learning a lot from the midwives who were precepting me. However, I was still feeling distant from the reasons and especially the women who I wanted to be a midwife for. I knew when I began school that my calling was to provide midwifery care to those who have little or no access to it, specifically Afghan and Muslim refugees in the U.S., as well as one day hoping to work internationally in areas of conflict or crisis. As I continued clinical rotations in a wealthy area of California, I was learning a lot but didn't feel connected um, to my true passions. That's when I began researching how I could use my skills as a nurse and as a student midwife in the refugee crisis in Greece. So how did I choose the organization that I was going to work with? Uh, when I decided that I would go to Greece over the winter break, to use my skills and experiences, I began to um, do a lot of reflecting and thinking about the values that I would look for in an organization. I think it's important to know your skills and your limitations, especially as a student, as well as the values that are important to you when deciding where you're going to volunteer. For me, cultural sensitivity, empowerment of individuals, and working on a team were important. 
For instance, I was asked to work with several organizations where I would be the only women's health care provider, and I knew that as a student I wasn't provided, I wasn't prepared to do that. So I decided not to accept those invitations. The organization that I did work with in Greece is called Nurture Project International, and I'm going to share a lot about their work with you now. So before I share some more stories about the women that I met and the experiences I, I had in Greece, I just want to give you a brief overview of um, obstetric and women's health care needs in Greece. Um, so from the Nurture Project International website, it says that according to the International Rescue Committee, there are 62,000 refugees currently in Greece. Over half of them are women and children. The demographics of the population require specialty care, which we all understand, regarding infant and young child feeding and support for pregnant and lactating women. While a significant amount of resources have flooded the area since the beginning of the crisis, challenges remain in adequately addressing individual needs, um, more so than just donations or the large amount of resources that have come into the country. With the Balkan countries closing their borders in early March 2017, the refugee population remains stranded in Greece for the foreseeable future. And then from an article that I'll share with you at the end um, from The Guardian on um, healthcare in Greece. A preliminary report on antenatal care, birth, and postnatal care of re refugees in Greece shows that of the 29 women questioned, 60% had received C-sections, in line with the extremely high cesarean rate in the general Greek population. Of these women, only one was given an epidural, and all of them were all of the others were given full anesthesia, even though there was no way to take any medical history because of lack of translation. So women recovering from the trauma and stress of fleeing war in their home countries, caring for their children in refugee camps, are being re-traumatized by the lack of choices, unsafe conditions, and fear surrounding birth and um, breastfeeding. And that's where Nurture Project International comes in. So I provided their website, and I highly encourage any of you who are interested to go and look at um, some of the resources and information that they have available. So the vision of NPI is a safe and supported motherhood is a human right. NPI works to create a world where that right is upheld in every crisis and emergency. They provide technical lactation support, reproductive health care, and nutrition support to families on the front line at the time they need it. They also um, work closely with other organizations such as MSF, um, Syrian American Medical Society, and Refugee Trauma Initiative. They work to develop innovative technology to provide access to lactation support to vulnerable families, advocate for change in the humanitarian field by informing policies specifically on lactation and women's health care rights. And they facilitate access to and train healthcare providers within their own organization as well as others to apply technical skills to the unique needs of vulnerable families in refugee camps. NPI began in 2016 when founder Brooke Bauer, who's a lactation consultant from the US, saw the need for breastfeeding support in refugee camps in Greece. They're currently working in Greece and have a new project in Iraq as well. As we go through some of the photos from the camps, I'll talk about how I saw them filling a specific need in the refugee um, camps in Greece. In Iraq, they are currently doing mentorship and training of Iraqi midwives and traditional birth workers on lactation support and prenatal care, rather than just bringing in Western uh, midwives to take over the role that Iraqi women can um, fill themselves. So the next few slides are going to have a lot of pictures um, that I think help to tell the story of what's going on in Greece better than um, I can by just sharing with you my experiences. Uh, so this is a picture of a man um, cooking a meal for his family inside one of the tents in a refugee camp in Greece. Um, and I just think it shows not only um, how real these families are, I think that was one of the first things that struck me was that um, these 
families came from um, highly educated, wealthy backgrounds, um, and all of a sudden are living in a camp and still need to learn how to provide food for their families. Um, how do they get education for their children in this in this setting? And then um, even a lot of them would say, what do we do with our time? Um, because being just sitting in a refugee camp all day long um, with little resources or things to do. Um, so I think that just brings light to that. Um, this is another picture of one of the camps in Greece um, and some of the tents that the families would live in. Um, so one of the unique things that NPI does is they provide prenatal care to all pregnant women in the camps that they're located in. Um, so one woman's story that I wanted to share with you is just a good reminder of the importance of midwifery care for all women. Um, I was providing prenatal care in her small room that her family called home. She was a young woman, um, 37 weeks along with her th fifth child and alone. Her husband was in another European country, and the rest of her family had been scattered when they fled Syria. As we sat there, um, one of my colleagues helped play with her children, and it was probably one of the first times that she had had a chance to sit down and just take a breath in the last couple of weeks, um, trying to care for all of her children and find something for them to do all day, every day in this um, setting. So I empowered her to care for herself by teaching her simple ways to reduce the discomforts of pregnancy. Um, she was having a lot of lower back pain. So we talked about how she could even use um, a scarf that almost all Syrian women have with them to support her lower back um, and taught her how to do that herself when she was alone. And we brought back a sense of normalcy just by sitting, talking, and listening to the baby's heartbeat and just letting her be still in that moment. This is the beauty of midwifery to me, um, helping bring normalcy, health, and wholeness, especially to women in crisis who might not otherwise experience it. This is a picture of one of the young NPI babies um, in one of the camps. And right now, many of the camps in Thessaloniki, which is the city that I worked in in Greece, um, the camps are closing or have closed, um, and that brings new challenges to the work that NPI is doing. Um, during the winter, the camps got so cold that it was no longer safe for the um, refugees to continue living there. And the UNHCR um, began to move refugees from the camps into what they call hotel settings. Um, so they're small rooms. Um, each family has one small room. Um, they're communal bathrooms and possibly a communal kitchen. Sometimes no kitchen is available and um, just food is provided to them um, when the food is available. Um, so while that means that there is access um, to a bathroom and it's warm, um, it brings other challenges, specifically that um, NGOs such as NPI are having a harder time following up with refugees and a lot of people are getting lost in the shuffle um, as they try to figure out which hotel and where um, in Greece the refugees have been taken and, and how to continue to follow up with with them when they aren't just going from one tent to the next, um, but having to take the mobile unit and drive from hotel to hotel um, and, and how to best provide those services to all pregnant women um, that have now been scattered. And the reason for, um, for closing some of these camps is because some of the camps um, in other parts of the country were becoming over full. And so eventually these camps will then be refilled um, with, with people from the camps that are now um, full, but that hasn't happened yet. So I think um, one of the things that's unique about NPI is that they see these needs and they continue to try to fill them even when it's not necessarily um, how they began their work. Um, so when they saw that refugees and were being moved to the hotels, then they um, developed a protocol for a mobile unit and continued to provide care for these women um, as they were moved around. Um, this is just another picture of uh, one of the tents. And then um, this mom, you can see she was washing her family's clothing and was hanging it outside um, the tent to dry. So NBI began with breastfeeding support. 
Um, lactation consultants provide support to all women in the camps who are breastfeeding. They provide extra help to women having difficulties as well as to women who have stopped breastfeeding and want to relactate. They also educate pregnant women and even women who aren't pregnant about the benefits of breastfeeding so that they can support each other. Um, as, as I'm sure you all know, um, it's especially important to breastfeed in this fragile environment. There's no access to clean water. Um, sterilization equipment is obviously not available, and there's an unstable access to the, an ongoing supply of formula. Uh, what happened, what they saw was that many NGOs just immediately began giving pregnant, and, um, pregnant women and infants formula without having a long-term plan in place about how that formula would continue to be supported. Um, and as we know, with bottles not being sterilized, many infants were getting sick, um, some were um, malnourished and even dying because of lack of access to clean water to make the formula. Um, so that's when NPI stepped in and began um, teaching other NGOs that breastfeeding really needed to be supported and encouraged as the only safe way to feed an infant in a um, refugee camp. However, um, something that some people ask sometimes is if a woman is unable or unwilling to breastfeed, uh, NPI does continue to support them and they support with one-time use bottles so that the lack of clean water or sterilization equipment is not important um, because they give pre-made one-time use bottles and then they give them to the women every several days. Um, so they're following up with them, making sure that they are feeding them correctly and then disposing of the dirty bottles after. So nutritional support is another area that NPI is now currently providing help with. Um, they give meal packs to women and children every week from six months to two years old and then any pregnant or lactating women. Um, they do this because, as I said, they believe, um, as we all do, that breastfeeding is the best way um, to support an infant in this unstable environment. So the best way to feed a baby is to feed the mother um, to make sure that she's getting adequate nutrition so that she's able to provide um, breast milk to her children and um, it's really just important to them that they provide culturally appropriate food um, they provide halal food so that means no pork products um, and it's fresh so um, whereas the UNHCR provides some staples such as rice or other dry products um, NPI is providing additional support with fresh foods um, fruits and vegetables and meat that they wouldn't otherwise get um, from UNHCR. Uh, NPI also has support groups. So while I was there, um, it was over New Year's and we got to have a New Year's party. And this is a picture um, from a party like that where we would get treats um, and fruit that were just um, special to them in their culture and they, they didn't have access to very often. And so it would just be an exciting time uh, where women could come to the women's tent that NPI has at every camp that they work in. And it's just a sacred space. Um, no men are allowed in that camp, in the tent, only women women and children, and it's a protected space for women to come, um, to talk, and to bond, not only between each other, but also with the MPI volunteers who are there. Um, they also host women's classes in these rooms, so sometimes that means a breastfeeding class or breastfeeding support group. Um, when I was there, we had a contraception class, so um, one of the organizations that NPI works closely with um, brought in obstetricians and they talked about contraception and what the options are um, for contraception even in the camp. Um, these women, as long as um, they're in a camp where these NGOs are supporting them, um, do have access to IUDs. They have access to um, birth control pills and then um, NPI provides condoms whenever a woman needs them as well as referrals to um, um, to long-term birth control. And like I said, it's a safe space um, without men that they can process the trauma of their life, the trauma of coming to the refugee camp. They can talk about their birth experiences. Um, and if it comes up that one of the women needs more support with mental health issues, um, NPI will provide referrals to Refugee Trauma Initiative or to MSF, Doctors Without Borders.
So every um, camp that, ref that NPI works in has two tents. The first is the women's tent that I was just talking about. And the second is the baby hammam. Um, hammam means bath. And um, in Assyrian culture, giving the baby a bath is very important um, for the mother. And there was no safe bathrooms. Many women even had their older children begin using diapers again at night because of the risk of going to the bathroom outside in the middle of the night. Um, there was cold, dirty water in the showers and lack of soap available. So the baby hammam provides a private, warm, and safe place for the mother and the baby to bond. Volunteers do not give the baths to the children. Um, instead, they give the power back to the mom to um, have that sacred part of her job back as a mother. Soap, towels, hot water, and diapers are provided and clothes on a case-by-case -case basis if needed. And then lastly, infant health is um, another aspect of the care that NPI provides. Um, so diapers and wipes are provided to all um, mothers who need them. And then um, frequent weighing and measuring and doing health checks of all the babies who are breastfeeding or um, beginning on solid foods to make sure that babies are growing adequately and don't need extra support in that way. And then, as I said, um, referrals to MSF and Syrian American Medical Society or other NGOs are um, often done if the midwife or the nurse thinks that it's necessary. So finally, I want to share a quick story about a woman that I worked with in Greece. Lila was a young woman. Uh, she was living in the refugee camp and went into preterm labor, which is quite common. Um, she was transported to the hospital and delivered her first child at 36 weeks. The infant was kept in the NICU for four weeks after delivery for breathing support and for feeding. Lila, however, was discharged back to the camp. She would travel to visit the baby as much as she could, um, but as you can imagine, it's quite difficult, having to find a bus and the money and um, support to get there. The baby was discharged at four weeks of age, um, and when we did the first check when she got back to the camp that day, we noted that the IV location was infected. There was a large wound on the foot um, because the IV hadn't been rotated probably the whole time that she was in the NICU. Um, so as you can imagine, the wound was quite large and um, infected. So uh, we didn't have many supplies, and it was over a holiday when this was going on. So myself and the other midwife um, created a dressing as best as we could and tried to, um, to sterilize, the um, clean the wound as well as we could. Um, the baby also continued to lose weight as they had been giving formula only in the hospital, and then mom was trying to breastfeed when she came back to the camp. We talked to the family about needing to take the baby back to the hospital for weight um, support as well as to get the wound treated um, and for needing systemic um, antibiotics. However, the mother and especially the father were traumatized by seeing the care that was provided to the mom and the baby, and he want, didn't want to take them back to the hospital. He was just trying to protect his family. He even told me at one point um, we would have gotten better care at the hospital in Syria than what we got here. So NPI hired a Syrian translator who had also been a refugee, and she helped with cultural understanding and with translation. Um, eventually, she was able to explain to them why it was important that we took the baby back to the hospital, and they went. the midwife and the translator went with them um, to the hospital. So as you can see, that one-on-one -on -one support of moms and babies um, is a key role that NPI plays. They build trust with the women so that even as volunteers come in and out, they trust anyone who works with NPI because they've seen um, how they continue to show up and help with their needs. So how to prepare for this work. Um, I know many of you may have experience. Uh, so this is coming more for students or people who don't have experience. So I've learned a lot of lessons. These are just a few of them. Um, my first is prepare before you go. Research, learn about the situation, the culture, and maybe even a bit of the language. Um, evaluate your ability and capacity to cope with harsh conditions. But I think more importantly, to be able to engage with women who have experienced trauma and loss without re-traumatizing them by becoming overwhelmed or needing them to carry the weight of their experiences that they're sharing with you. 
There are many roles for individuals who aren't able to go to the field, as I'm sure you know, um, fundraising, raising awareness, education, and mentorship. It's important to have someone who you can debrief with after returning or if you're working long term on a regular basis. Um, so I have a friend who's a therapist and I talk to her almost every week about um, the domestic violence work that I do. Have a sense of humor and don't take yourself too seriously. Um, it, when I went to Grace, it was much different than I expected and um, like I think I noted um, the bathrooms need to be clean, the storage area needed to be organized, um, and even if that's not our specialty, we need to, um, to be able to step in and do those things so that we can see the long-term success of the organization you're working with. And lastly, um, something I'm continuing to learn is that women, the needs, and the work is so much bigger than any of us. Um, it, was before, it was there before us and will continue to go on when we leave. Um, so that reminds me of two things. One is that it's okay to take a break and to take care of myself when I need to. And second is that I am not the savior. I simply have tools and skills I can bring to the table to help the women help themselves. So these are just a few resources that I wanted to provide, um, some things that I've done that were helpful. And I'm sure if you end up going and working with an organization, they'll have extra educational resources for you. Um, the first is an excellent trauma counseling certificate that I would recommend um, anyone working with women in any setting look into. Um, it's an online graduate level certificate, and it helps you to learn about um, trauma, how to provide trauma-informed care, referrals, um, and many other issues in trauma. Um, and the second is the minimum initial services package. It um, teaches about re reproductive health care in crisis settings and the minimum care that must be provided to all women, um, no matter the setting. So I would highly encourage anyone who's even interested in this kind of work to take um, the MISP. It's also an online course. Um, these are several organizations, NPI like I talked about, and Midwife Pilgrim. They will be doing the next presentation, so I highly encourage you to stay and learn about the work that they're doing and how they place midwives around the world for volunteer work. And lastly, these are just a few articles um, that I found helpful and that you can look into and um, read about the work and um, how to prepare. So I just wanted to finish with this quote um, from Brooke Bauer, the CEO of NPI, in reference to the work with refugees in Greece. The time is now to hold space for our fellow woman, to take a step back and say, I might not fully understand what's going on here, but I will stand back and give you the platform. In our work, we are not the saviors that go in with all of the answers. The mothers have the answers. We just hold space for their voice. So I thank you all for your attention. And if you have any questions, I would love to open it up for questions now. Lillian, thank you for a quite informative presentation, giving us a snapshot into life in the refugee camp. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about the concept of women's safe spaces within refugee camps? Yes, yeah, so um, as you may have heard, if you've been following the refugee crisis or um, reading articles about it, there is a high number of um, sexual assaults in refugee camps um, in Greece and, and a need for a safe place for women um, to be with their children without the risk of sexual assault or violence or exposing their children to violence um, that's going on between other men um, in the camps. And so that's why for NPI, the safe space for women is so important. Um, it's literally a safe space from um, the risk of violence, as well as a safe space to be able to um, share their thoughts and their feelings surrounding what they've gone through, um, surrounding being a mom um, during this transition in their life, um, breastfeeding, um, all of the issues around women's health care and contraception. Um, so NPI has a small, um, it's, a, it's a tent, but it's a permanent tent um, that stays in the camp. 
and um, they made it into a beautiful space with rugs and pillows and places to sit. Um, tea is available to the women, and it's just a place to come and sit and take a breath, um, to be around other women, and to just know that they um, are able to talk about the issues that are going on in their life. Quite amazing um, and definitely required. So I think for those with a Western perspective, you can think of a continual standing red tent concept to support the women who are displaced. Lillian briefly touched on the concept of safety again, because the toilets and the latrine situation, um, that can actually be one of the most dangerous points for women in camps going to the bathroom, so that actually leads to another women's health issue of a lot of the UTIs or the latrines actually being the site where women would report um, sexual assault um, is happening, so something that can be quite a scary thing, and not just for the participants, but for sometimes the volunteers and workers. So, Lillian, one last question. How did you deal with the fear associated with, you know, going to this place where there are people from everywhere? What would you suggest to those considering volunteerism to deal with any fear? Um, yeah, so I think that um, being aware ahead of time, um, so I did a lot of research, like I said. Um, I knew that that was an issue when I went in, um, that that there was a risk um, for violence and for assault. Um, so I think NPI does a good job of preparing their volunteers. Um, we did a lot of reading and many, many Oh no, we've lost we've lost Lillian. We seem to have lost Lillian. She was speaking to the issue of preparation um, for these experiences. The reality is that you read, you prepare, and go into it with the, the knowledge that as much as you prepare, you have to remain extremely flexible because the textbooks and the newspapers are never quite able to give an accurate position. Ah, there's Lillian coming back. So having an open heart and not letting negative reports um, stop the progress. Thank you all. Are there any last Remembering questions that before we close? Out the session? Oh, I thought someone said, do men in grief give support to women? Um, so the camps that NPI primarily works in are camps that are primarily women and children um, and possibly some um, men if they're married. Um, but more of the young men, single men, live in the other camps to help mitigate some of the risks that we were talking about. Um, and I would say that it all depends on the family. Um, some, fam some men are not supportive of women. Um, they're not supportive of breastfeeding. Um, and other men are. Some men are, are especially helpful with the children. They're um, supportive of their women, um, like the husband that I was talking about with the young um, infant who was sick. He was extremely supportive of his wife and of his family. Um, so I think that that depends on the um, unique family situation. Thank you very much, Lillian, for this informative presentation in a time where issues of disaster and conflict are hugely in the news and in our realities and where some say it's more dangerous to be a woman in times of conflict than to be an armed soldier. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. We'd like to remind um, everyone that the sessions are recorded so that you can go back and refer.